and try to figure out what was the why that motivated you to create positive change or positive impact historically. Really a thunder buddy is someone who's gonna whack you across the head and say, hey, you're missing your blind spot. You're a little bit off here. Just because something works for only a year, doesn't mean that I throw it out because it doesn't stick for 10 years. Right, because it still worked for a year. It still worked for a year. Today's guest defied all odds after a vicious physical assault in his early 20s left him with a traumatic brain injury that forced him into nearly three years of full-time rehabilitation. Now, he battled back. He was able to claw his way to earning a degree and then a master's, and now he's gone on to become one of the most inspiring leadership speakers I know of. Now, if you've ever felt, you ever felt like a major setback robbed you of your chance, or if you feel like your past had way more potential than your future has, or heck, maybe you just hate dealing with the changes that life throws at you. No matter which one it is, this episode's for you, because I talk about all of that and a whole lot more with this week's special guest, Jacob Green. Welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast. For me, as you know, my story is all about my brain injury and, um, you know, when I interrupted the robbery and and yeah. got so, smashed so let's, in the head. Let's, and, get, let's get into that. So you, yeah. so you were, you were off at uni or college yeah. or whatever you call it. Yeah. Um, and one night, you know, you're in, you're just going through a subway station, totally random, and you trip across what a robbery or something. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, you know, I was, uh, I was working as a what was called a Berkeley guide. So I went off to University of California, Berkeley. It's going to change the world, and I had all these incredible visions about what I was going to do in the world, and and uh, studying international relations and going to go in the State Department, I'm a diplomat, all that kind of good stuff. And uh, I was working as a little part-time Berkeley guide, helping people get from point A to point B. And I came upon this robbery going on. And uh, when I intervened, I ended up getting smashed on the head pretty good, uh, six or seven blows. And and uh, then, then everything changed. And, and literally... Can, can yeah. I ask you, sorry, to yeah. know, can I ask you in that moment, did you mean, like, I know that you intervened in the moment, but was it literally just this reaction and then suddenly this person's on you and suddenly they're attacking you or did you know was there a, was there a moment where you went i'm gonna do the right thing here yeah so um you know the the thing that struck me first was he was attacking two subway, subway workers inside their subway booth and uh you know those subway workers they were screaming and yelling and it was a bad scene and the only thought that triggered for me and and you know you've talked about i've seen some of your postings and your writings and your background. And, you know, you've talked about some of the influences of our childhood and our growing up and things that we've experienced. And, and, and for me, it was just, I was not going to watch this unfold. Um, that's, that was the extent of my plan. So clearly the rest of the plan wasn't well thought out. Um, but I just wasn't going to watch this take place in front of me. It just, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't okay. And, um, you know, th that was it. Uh, sometimes we just go into some of those areas in our brain and, and we respond and, and, and act. And, uh, you know, for me, the, the situation isn't necessarily about that night as much of what happened, but much more interesting to me is what came in the years that followed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now it's been incredible. I would never take it back because it's led to me being on a podcast with you and, you know, being able to you flatter too much. I, I, well, well, it's amazing. I mean, I get to to meet people and work with people, and you know, everything from Fortune 100 companies to small private companies. My last keynote. I mean, this this tells you how you know, kind of change can really bring you to a next level. How can you take the issues and challenges um, and things that you've been through, both personally and professionally, and instead of just trying to move past them? actually learn from them and leverage them and apply them in your personal and professional life. Uh, so I really focus on the area of change and crisis management and adversity and, uh, you know, looking how we can get something out of this stuff instead of just trying to run right past it. Can people change? Honestly, can people change without yeah. a traumatic event happening, without them being on death's door, you know, you hear about it, right? The person who, who has a heart attack and the doctor says, stop smoking. And they go, well, I'm having a heart attack. I'm, I'm going to die anyway. I might as well die smoking yeah. or right. The, the, the teams where the leader knows how dysfunctional the team is 
the person who's vastly overweight, the person who's in a terrible marriage, the person who repeats the same cycle of thing over and over and over and over and over again. Can people actually change? Yeah, I think, you know, some people do change and some people don't. What I advocate for is don't let this opportunity go to waste. You know, the number one thing that terrifies me about COVID is not COVID itself. It's going through this experience and coming out on the other side because we know we're going to come out on the other side and feeling like, oh no, I didn't take advantage of the opportunities that COVID presented. You know, and so I feel like Every, every person needs to decide whether or not, you know, they, 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 they leverage that uh, situation that's come their way. But for me, I see how much personal and professional growth you can experience, how much uh, more effective and how greater the impact can be if you choose to actually reflect on and uh, learn from that which we're going through. So I think, yeah, some, you're right. Some people decide to just blaze through it. Um, and some people actually take some really time to reflect, figure out where their blind spots are, figure out what they've been through, what they've learned and try to apply it moving forward. But how can we, you know, like I know that I can't, I can't make someone else change, but you know, are there, are there life moments? Are there indicators? Are there things you can poke people with or do it to get, you know, like if I, if I was tired of, of all of the same stuff that I always have been doing, how, how can I change if I want to change, but I don't know how? Um, you have someone in your life that you're just like, oh, they're driving me crazy and I just can't deal with this anymore. They have to be able to change or whatever it might be. Um, yeah. I, know, I know on a system point of view, on an organizational point of view, you can pull different levers to replace people and are yeah. they on the right seat and are they on the right bus and this and that. But when it comes down to like matters of the heart or emotion or things like that, how can we get better at yeah. getting what we want? Yeah, good <laughs> Great, great stuff, Mark. So, you know, first of all, um, I think sometimes as, as humans, we all have blind spots and we all have uh, at times an inability to see our own situation and challenges uh, truthfully, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of the things I talk about in the book is the, the value of finding what I call, just because I love the, the movie Ted, a thunder buddy. And, you know, uh, especially in the workplace, especially in your business, especially when you're in a situation where you might be a supervisor or a manager or an entrepreneur or owner, um, when you're at sort of sometimes a higher level of an organization, people don't tell you the truth. They tell you what they think you want to hear in order so that they can keep the relationship positive and they can advance and everything can be honky dory. But that actually doesn't lead to any kind of self-improvement or organizational improvement. So I really talk about the value and importance of finding a Thunder Buddy. A Thunder Buddy can be anybody in your immediate environment, both personally and professionally, that you have a, an agreement with, that you have an actual conversation with, and the conversation is focused on the fact that you will be honest with each other. You will look out for each other. It comes from a place of really wanting the other to succeed. So Mark, if you and I were Thunder Buddies, which I hope we develop that kind of relationship, it would be, yeah, exactly. It would be about you being able to call me up and go, dude, what were you thinking on that podcast the other day? That was the most ridiculous thing I've ever had a guest say on any of my podcasts. What were you trying to get at? And really having this kind of authentic relationship, but motivated from a place that you want me to be successful. And so, you know, in my own career, um, I've looked for Thunder Buddies, not mentors. Thunder Buddies are not mentors. Very different. We understand what coaches and mentors are and they're important and they have a role, but really a thunder buddy is someone who's going to whack you across the head and say, Hey, you're missing your blind spot. You're a little bit off here. You know, this would have been a better way to handle this situation. I got really lucky in my career. I found my thunder buddy. Uh, his name is Daryl Polk. I write about him and he actually has a page in my book where he kind of gives his perspective on that relationship. But in order to really change and advance and sort of level up, in our personal and professional lives, I think you have to be open to having someone like a Thunder Buddy who will give you that honest feedback, slap you around a little bit, um, and, and it has your best intentions in mind. So circling around on the can people change question, the reason, the reason I ask is because I actually spent many, many years um, believing that people can't change, right? You know, people want to change, but they revert back to their natural tendencies very, very quickly, unless again, yeah. you know, traumatic event happens or something like that. Yeah. Um, and so I was staunch in like, you know, 
we have family of origin, we have childhood trauma, we have um, the way we process information, we have our, the, the way we think about time, we have whether we're in our head or our heart and all of these things that are baked into us. And so people are people and they're not going to change. You can't expect someone to change, right? The things that make them them are them. Um, and then, uh, you know, two years ago, I started a bit of a health journey myself and I've like lost 50 pounds. Um, I've gone from never working out to working out five times a week. I, I've gone from being fairly shy um, you know, I'm an introvert, but, um, but not wanting to put myself out there to now I'm putting myself out there. And suddenly I'm like, huh, that whole, like, that whole people don't change thing. One, I guess people do change. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, all the stuff that used to hold me back is still holding me back. Yeah. And yeah. so I've kind of seen both sides of it. And now yeah. what I'm trying to figure out is, is how do I, if I know I can change, if I know you can change, if we know systems and people and companies can change, yeah. because, we, because we know that they can, if there's enough leverage or it's painful enough or whatever's happening is enough, mm -hmm. how do we bring that change over to the other areas that we want to change and yet we still seem to revert back to? Gosh, well, you know, congrats too on your journey. I mean, uh, you know, the level, it, it takes a lot of discipline, right? I mean, um, you know, and sometimes... That, that voice I talk about in the book as imposter syndrome. You know, I didn't create that obviously, but yeah. um, I found that to be extremely relevant in this conversation about, you know, we get into a new position or we get into a new environment and we don't think we're worthy. And then we're terrified and scared away from doing something or, or you know, taking that first step and, you know, learning how to run that marathon or doing that, all that kind of stuff because of anxiety and fear of insecurity and the things that we went through in our childhood and in our past and the voices and the messages that play in our head. Would you say you're more of an optimistic person or an, a pessimistic person by nature? Uh, so I'd, I'd go on optimism, but I think if you talk to my family and friends, they would say like brutally, brutally realist. Um, and that's another interesting thing. Uh, I think that helps me with change. I'm very blunt and very direct. You know, um, all my teams, all my staff throughout the years, my employees, my assistants, everybody would tell you that I can be pretty brutally direct. But what I learned in brain injury is that when you really love someone and really care about somebody, you'll get rid of a lot of that noise and you'll try to communicate as direct and effectively as possible. And for me going through a brain injury, I had to have people communicate very directly with me and tell me what I was missing and tell me what I forgot and tell me where my deficits were. And so I carried that same situation into the workplace years on down the, down the road. And I learned that the tightest and most effective teams, the best organizations and companies are those where you can have really brutally honest, direct conversations and leave out the noise. I, uh, I've, I've been working on this for the last few years, but I'm basically the mayor of the capital city of, of hedge city. Like when it comes, you know, <laughs> when it, when it comes to hedging, yeah. um, you know, I didn't even realize how much I hedged because I would like, I had a staff member four or five years ago say, say, Mark, you say everything on your mind. And I thought, <laughs> I thought no, I, uh, no, I don't. If you realize what I had in my mind, you'd be crying right now. So the idea of being very, very blunt um, makes me incredibly uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, I worry that I'm going to hurt people's feelings. I'm yeah. worried that I'm going to be like uh, a giant jerk. Um, yeah how, how do you have you have, I mean, if it comes naturally to you, then you just do it and people live with it. How do you help people like me who want to be nice and liked? How, yeah. how can, how can we then provide more clarity by just one saying it out loud, but two also even understanding in our own heads, like what are we feeling? What are we thinking? What are we doing? Yeah. Great point. So three things. Um, number one, my thunder buddy that I mentioned before, Daryl, um, there was many meetings where he would come out of those meetings and sit down with me and say, you were too blunt. You were too direct. Uh, that was, that was a little uncalled for. And when you're in that Thunder Buddy relationship, remember you have kind of a pact and agreement that you're not going to get defensive because you know, the other person is looking out for your best. Interest. You're hitting all my keywords, man. Cause I'm the most defensive person as well. We all are. It's natural. <laughs> you're protecting yourself, right? I mean, we all want to protect ourselves, but sometimes being vulnerable actually leads to some growth. And so I had, had to be vulnerable and listening to Daryl and understanding that in certain situations, meetings, environments, um, my direct approach might need a little bit of softening. So that's number one. Number two is 
actually checking in with people and asking how you're being received, how you're communicating. I mean, I know that sounds like very cheesy and strange and bizarre, mm -hmm. but you know, I helped oversee about 1200 employees uh, in, in one of my organizations. And um, you know, the opportunity to check in with folks because there's so many people and they all receive information differently was helpful. So in one-on-one -on -one performance evaluations, when I would give performance reviews, I'd be asking them questions about my performance as well. Hey, you know, over the last year, can you think about times when I was communicating with you? Where, where did I kind of miss the boat? Where was I unclear in my direction? Did I offend you at all when I was communicating with you on you know, certain goals, certain you know, projects, da, 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 da. So actually checking with those people is the second thing that you need to do as a good leader and a good manager. And the third thing is understanding that each person is motivated differently in terms of communication. Mm. So some people need a lot of positive reinforcement. Well, if you're direct and blunt, for example, I had a boss who told me once, I checked in with him and I, I, wasn't, I wasn't feeling like I was performing to his expectations. And I said, you know, gosh, I haven't heard from you in like several weeks. Like, am I missing the boat? You know, what's wrong with me, right? And he goes, dude, no news is good news. Right. I was like, whoa. Okay, like I, I didn't even understand that. I was sweating buckets for three weeks, you know, violating the second agreement. I don't know if you've ever read the book, The Four Agreements, but it's, it's all about like, don't take every freaking thing personally, right? And I was thinking his silence was all about my underperformance and my lack of achievement and, and that I was pissing him off and, you know, he was just ignoring me. And no, he basically said, dude, no news is good news. So I was doing just fine. So, so I think it's about individually checking in with folks and asking, how do you like communication to be? Do you want me to let you know only when things need correcting? Because otherwise, if I'm not, are you going to consider me a micromanager? And I don't want to be a micromanager, but what is your style of comfort? And we don't spend any time in these conversations. We talked about, we talk about the projects. Mm -hmm. We talk about the goals, the stakeholders, the budget, all these kinds of things the marketing, you know, goals and the drip campaigns. We talk about all this kind of stuff. We don't actually talk about how do you want to be communicated with on a daily basis? If I email you, is that going to piss you off because I'm cluttering your inbox? Or right. do you actually prefer email over, over a phone call or a text? Phone you know? tap or whatever. I guess you can't tap on people's shoulders anymore, but. Yeah, yeah, I know we're all, it becomes even more important. In fact, I told an executive that I was working with, I told him right now, your strategy has to be over communicate because to your point, Mark, we don't have the cubicle. We don't have those inputs. Mm -hmm. We don't have the water cooler. We don't have all those, those, those cues. And so for all of your employees that you're managing or that are on your team, you got to do a lot of check-ins about communication and style and directness mm -hmm. and all these things that we're talking about right now in order to make sure that the change that happens isn't that they abort and leave the organization because you're missing the boat on how communication should be executed. Right. So can, can I ask you, um, the person you were before the, um, the, I don't know what you say, accident, incident, yeah. altercation, yeah. um, the person you were before, and then the person that you came to be several years later after recovery, yeah. um, obviously different age, different level of maturity, different experiences, but were you able to refine yourself or do you, do you think that there was a different person before and a very different person afterwards? Great question, man. Um, so, you know, I went through almost three years of full-time rehabilitation for the brain injury and, and uh, associated visual injury, visual impairment. A few key differences for me now. Number one, um, I don't avoid any crisis or challenge or anything ugly. And so the people that I work with, I think that's something that I bring to the table. I am not afraid of something that's broken, doesn't work, and that should be an asset. So when you've gone through a life crisis, like every single human being, by the way, because I'm in, in no means am I unique. When you've been through a crisis, you should actually reflect back on that a little bit and go, wow, I've got some new tools. I've got some new strengths. I can actually carry that with me. I'm a little bit stronger than I was back then. And, and I can deal with the challenges that come my way. Um, so I think number one, in terms of who I am now, it's someone that's not afraid or doesn't fear change or crisis. Um, number two, I'm not afraid at all of asking for help. When I was, you know, 17, 18, 16, 17, 18, it was overcompensating for insecurity is probably what really what it was. 
Uh, but yeah, you, you don't ask for help. You don't need that. You don't need help. You're a teenager. You're on your own. You know, you're going off to college. You're living on your own now and you can take care of everything. And you know, now, um, I have no problem leaning and here's why if you lean and ask for help from others, you know, when, when you have a brain injury, you get really good at doing this cause you have to do this. But when you're not afraid to lean, you can speed up time really, really quickly. Instead of dealing with a problem or a challenge for days or weeks or months, if I just pick up the phone and call Mark and be like, hey, dude, I'm stuck. I'm having a really big problem right now. Chances are two brains are going to be a heck of a lot better than just my injured brain, right? And so I learned really quickly that leaning is critical. And the best leaders and the best organizations are ones that humble down, know they have blind spots and challenges, and just lean, mm. right? Um and I think but, number but leaders like inexperienced leaders, yeah. In, you know, those of us who are insecure or inexperienced or whatever believe that people are looking to us for the answers. So we better yes. have all the answers. Yes. Right. And we're dealing with, we're dealing with it right now in the companies I'm dealing with, with COVID. This is interesting. You know, really successful entrepreneurs, what were they good at? They were building it good at building a widget or building a service, marketing, building a team, getting it out there, and, and making impact, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't go through training on how to deal with mega crisis, no. like COVID, a pandemic, yeah. right? Or and cabin so fever or, or cabin fe all, all these new factors, or, yeah, yeah. All, all these new issues and challenges. And so what I see is the leaders right now in COVID that are willing to say, you know what, team, just like you, I don't have all the answers, but together we're gonna figure this out and we're gonna get to the other side. Those leaders, even though they're admitting that they don't have all the answers, they're creating an honest connection, an authentic connection with their people who are terrified and going through fear right now. So as a leader, one of the most powerful thing you can do is not having all the answers. It's connecting with your people on an authentic level hmm. versus the leaders right now in COVID that are saying, I can handle this. I can take this. And they're taking a really, um, uh, they're taking this approach that they're supposed to have all the answers. And so they're making really stupid decisions and really isolating their people and creating more uncertainty and more confusion and more conflicting guidance and trying to do everything alone as an Island because they're stuck in this. I'm the leader thing. Those are organizations I don't know are going to survive on the other end of this. So, um, you know, you know, I think there's a tremendous value in taking a step back and being able to admit to your people, well, I don't have all the answers, we are going to search and try to figure this out together. Hmm. And the, the other thing, so, so I, I, I would imagine that if I was in your situation, um, I would think, why me? Why did I do that? Why did I step in? Why didn't I come 10 minutes later? Why didn't I, why, you know, like, why, why, why? And then the other thing I would think, I imagine at some point during recovery would be to think, is it even worth it is it like what's the point mm. did did you find yourself facing those kinds of things or were you so well were, did you find yourself facing those types of feelings yeah yeah totally I, i'd be completely lying if i wasn't i mean um i i talk pretty openly about you know some of my lowest moments in rehab i mean there were many days i had this little 800 square foot apartment next to my rehabilitation facility it had a Murphy bed and a gray blow up couch and uh, a, a very small little pathetic computer desk uh, next to the Murphy bed. That's all I had. And so many nights I would sit on the edge of that Murphy bed, you know, wondering if getting to the next day was worthwhile. And I had two thoughts. One was, is it worthwhile to make it through this night? And the second one was, if it is, please let me figure out a way to make use of this someday. Please don't let this be a total waste of my little blip human life here on earth. And so literally to keep myself alive, I would jump in my car. I, I, don't, I don't know, you know if you're familiar with Pacific Coast Highway out here in California, but I would drive up and down Pacific Coast Highway from about 10 o'clock at night till four in the morning because I knew if I was driving, I was keeping myself alive. And so I spent a lot of days and a lot of nights and a lot of weeks, months in, in, a, in a situation of misery and at some lows and wondering why. But at the same time, on the other shoulder was this little voice trying to say, you know, don't waste this. 
you know, let, learn from this, watch what's going on, try to make sense of this, this world around you and try to figure out how to leverage this someday. And so uh, as soon as I could do that, I figured out how to do that. And, and I, for me personally, you know, um, my own mantra hasn't been everything happens for a reason. Just for me personally, that didn't give me a lot of, um, a lot of uh, uh, strength. Um, I changed that. For me, it was, I have to find reason in everything that happens. And so mm. I spent a lot of time reflecting on what can I do with this and how do I apply it to help others in their businesses or in their personal lives? That's amazing. And, and you, you answered the second part of the question I was going to ask, which was what was the, the, the beacon or the North star that kind of pulled you through? That was the North star that, that, that was every, you know, every single day to get me out of that low pit and, and, you know, questioning moving on. It was, please don't be wasteful, like figure out how to find some reason, find some purpose and what was going on. And, and a big driver, by the way, for that, uh, was, um, Victor Frankl's man's search for meaning. I don't know if you've read that book for you and your listeners. If you have not read Victor Frankl's man's search for meaning, um, highly recommended international bestseller published in 55 languages. Um, the story of essentially a Holocaust survivor. He was a, mm -hmm. a, psycho a psychiatrist and a neurologist sent off to Auschwitz and he essentially uh, challenges Freud, ends up challenging Freud and creates the school of logotherapy, which basically said those who survive are those who can attach themselves to meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so it was sort of a very influential book for me. And, and I, I, I've, I've tried, I've wasted a lot of time certainly, but I've tried to figure out how to create meaning and purpose out of some of these events. I, I think that's amazing. And, so I, I was just having a conversation uh, maybe about an hour and a half ago uh, about health. And we were talking about health and uh, I was saying how the reason I was able to lose 50 pounds, um, go from being someone who never really dieted to someone who dieted, someone who never really was worked out to someone who works out, someone who is not really that competitive and I'm trying to get more competitive. I wasn't disciplined, I'm trying to get disciplined. Was that I had this really big lever, like I had this really big why because I went to an event and, and ultimately I, 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 I told myself that if I didn't get healthy, um, that, that I would not meet my grandkids. Mm -hmm. So I have four kids. Mm -hmm. you know, Me too. Do you? Hey, awesome. So yeah, yeah. 13 to six years old, four kids. Same. I, really? <laughs> 12 to five. Well, there you go. I got, a, I, got a 13, I got a 13 year old, an 11 year old, an eight year old and a six year old. Oh man, we are in the same boat. That's great. There you, there you go. But um, uh, I, and I thought, well, it's not like, oh, I might not walk my daughters down the aisle. Well, that kind of gets me, but, but yeah. worse. And I just made it worse and worse and worse until it was so painful. that mm. it was like, now, you know, if I run out of breath on the treadmill, it's like, I am meeting my grandkids. Like I, I have it. And, and so I, I, one point in my life, one area of my life, I've been able to find this why that is mm -hmm. painful enough and hard enough that I can draw on 50% of the time. Mm -hmm. And the other areas of my life, people that might, you know, I have friends, I have, I have my uh, thunder buddy who's like, you know, you yeah. need a stronger why you just don't want it bad enough. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I just have not figured out how to give myself in these other areas, mm -hmm. something, a why that is strong enough. Mm -hmm. So, I love what you're saying about the idea of rather than like searching for meaning in the experience. Mm. Do you find for yourself that you have these different levels of why as well? Are you able to attribute or create these really strong, deep whys? Because honestly, mm. if it's not really, really like painful or compelling for me, I just yeah. don't do it. Yeah. I just, I just won't do it at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, so Mark, let me ask you a question. So, how long have you been able to, how long did your why change the course of your overall health? Like how long have you been on this path now? A year and a half. See, that's, that's extraordinary. I mean, um, to get 18 months uh, from that. And so for you, correct me if I'm wrong, you had to create a why that was almost a, a threat, right? It was almost a- Threat level you know, midnight. Yeah, yeah. Threat yeah, level like, midnight, right? You almost had to create something that would create some- some additional fear and anxiety, I, right? So, in, like uh, scarcity mentality, 
man, I'm living there. Um, yes. uh, imposter syndrome, 100%. Yes. Um, uh, some, someone who um, has tons of anxiety and is scared that everything is going to go wrong and it's a catastrophe, that's me. So like, if it's not, if it's not like, if it's a really, really deep threat, mm. then I become apathetic because there's no point. Yeah. It has to be this painful enough to, to really scare me into moving. And yeah. then um, because, because I, I live in the future, so I can imagine the most amazing things, but it doesn't mean I'll ever start or do them yeah. or stick with them. So yeah, yeah it, it has to be painful or, or kind of painful. scary. And, and so I like to ask, you know, a place that I like to start with all my coaching clients is what was your why that worked before? So don't try to create a new why right now. Mm -hmm. Just go back in your life and mm -hmm. try to figure out what was the why that motivated you to create positive change or positive impact historically. Now let's start from there because we know that worked. Let's start with what worked in your life, right? It, it, it depends if it was healthy or not. Like, if it was like, healthy or not. If it was healthy like, or not. Then honestly, I don't think recognition it's, yeah. was the thing that used to drive me before. Which mm. is, I do things out of duty, you know. Hey, like J Jacob, you're asking me for help. Um, I don't really want to help you, but I'm going to help you because, yeah. because you asked me for help. Mm -hmm. And I don't really want to spend four hours helping you on Saturday morning, but you asked for help. So I'm going to do it and I'm going to show up. And then if I'm going to show up, I, I need to make sure that I earn at the end of it where you're like, Mark, you did an amazing job. And I'm going to be like, yeah, thank you. I did do an amazing job. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what drove me for, two, for a really long time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then having, and, and again, going back to the Thunder Buddy, being able to have someone to bounce it off of is, hey, when I was motivated by that, what kind of impact did that have on the people around me? What kind of impact that, well, you know, you gained an extra 50 pounds and you were really a pain to be around and you were kind of drinking a little bit too much because you were unhappy. You know, I mean, okay, well then that was, that's not something that, you know, that we're going to use as our driver right now, but we may want to you know, hone in and have a conversation about the why in terms of the opposite of those things and what we might be seeking and what that could lead to. But I think in general, when I have the conversation, it's about look back in your life and figure out what motivated you to create some positive impact and change historically. And let's see if that's still relevant today, because maybe it's a tool that, that works very effectively. You just kind of buried it and forgot about it. Or whether or not we need to sort of rethink what our current, like what you did, is think about your kids and, you know, kind of the impact on your kids. Kids can be a great life motivator for change, right? Mm -hmm. And then taking a step further, because most of my work is working with executives and folks in organizations, mm -hmm. is have you shared your why with your staff and your team? Everyone says no. Okay, well, if you want to create authentic connection with your people and you want to help those team members that are a little bit lost, they're a little bit off course and they need some help, you need to have a conversation about your why. And then find out what their why is. Find out how they're motivated. Because if you're the boss and you know what their why is, oh my gosh, you can absolutely enhance performance and output of all the people that you're working with if you know what is driving them from the onset. And then try to create a collective why. The next so, step is try to make sure that your team organization is on the same page with a collective why. So aside from handing them, like, so in my, in my organization in Fanta, we have this thing called Fanta U where we have a list of books we ask people to read month by month by month as they onboard, um, just so they can get a sense of what we think, how they feel and whatnot. So awesome. start with why is certainly there. Um, yeah. Evan Carmichael's book, Your One Word is there. So Put Victor Frankel's on there, man. I'm I, telling you, Mark. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to get, like, I'm working through this right now, so... Um, oh wow! You're no joke. But, yeah, Ray Dalio. Um, yep, you're but, no joke. Uh, I will uh, get. I will get the book that you mentioned. Yeah. Um, so aside, I, honestly though, I think I think most people don't think about their purpose. Most people don't think about their why's. Most people wouldn't know how to answer that question. Yeah. Um, I spent a lot of time and a lot of I spent a lot of time thinking about these things, and even then, I have struggled. I struggled to articulate what I want. I was at. I was at a Tony Robbins event at Unleash the Power Within. Mm. Uh, my friend Evan took us down. Evan works with them, so we got invited. Um, we got invited to sit. I don't know if you've been at one of their events, but, no. but right off the stage. I got to pick your brain about it, huh? Okay, so we can. Right off the stage yeah. um, is kind of a private area. So, so we had special badges. We had a special entrance. I was sitting beside actors. Sean White was there. You know, he was sitting in our cool. group. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like a nobody. Uh, who's with a somebody, but because I was sitting there, everyone who was there thought I was a somebody. Mm. 
And so I'm perfectly happy to have those conversations and be a part of it and whatnot. But I'm working with these people. I'm working with Tony Robbins as a partner. We're in this exercise and the guy that I'm with is the godfather of the partner's kids. So like people who really are in the circle and the guy stops me and he turns to me and goes, Mark, you don't know what you want. <laughs> you don't know what you want. Hmm. And so, and so that stuck with me because I realized it's like, I spend a lot of time thinking. I spend a lot of time planning. I spend a lot of time spinning, but ultimately I find it really hard to define what is that why mm. to, to, to share with people that I want this without feeling egotistical or um, uh, overly ambitious yeah. uh, or trying to explain why I want what I want. I don't know why yeah. I want what I want. I do. Um, so what do I actually want? I can't articulate. Um, I don't want to share it with people because I'm worried they're going to judge me. Yeah. Um, I, I find it really hard to actually stick with today. This is today's why. In a month, it may be a different why because I'm excited about something else because mm -hmm. I'm an entrepreneur and that's how I work. <laughs> how do you help people like me? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're not giving yourself a, you're, uh, enough credit, obviously, for what you've accomplished, but also to the fact that you are going through this process just by having this conversation and you know, you're, you're eliminating your blind spots. You're admitting where your challenges are not where if you, if you need assistance and, and uh, some help refining so you can put on a post-it note, what your why is you can deal with that, but it's a lot tougher to work with someone who doesn't even understand the value of getting to that place mm -hmm. and is not willing to admit that there are challenges to getting there and that there's fears and anxieties and all those things. So I wouldn't worry about you you at all, Mark, uh, you're fine. Um, but, uh, and, and making sure that you're surrounded by people that you can bounce these things off of, you know, Evan, you, and so, et cetera. So I know you work in corporate environments and yeah. corporate environments are like, they're, 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 you're a number and they're square and they're all that. And I, I work in the kind of crazy entrepreneur environment or what have you, but, yeah. but in all the environments you've been to, um, are people really actually resistant to the idea of having a purpose and having a why and having direction in their life and realizing that this, that aligning these things will make them happier. And like, are people actually resistant to this? I mean, I think in most organizations, these conversations just don't take place. Ah, so it's, um, it's, it's apathy or, or lack of even of yeah, awareness or whatever. And, yeah. And lack of leadership and managers bringing this into the workplace. I mean, you know, you and I are dealing with really innovative, really progressive companies. Um, and they're doing this stuff all the time. I mean, these are the speakers that they bring in. These are the books that they read. I mean, you've had a monthly book. Like, I mean, it's, it's like amazing, right? You're, you're so far ahead of what most organizations are doing. So to answer your question, I think it's just a total lack of understanding that if you're not having these conversations, if you're not talking about the whys and you're not creating alignment and understanding motivation and how people can connect, you're, you're going to plateau as a company mm -hmm. or a business. You just can't go through big challenges and change and crises if you don't have some of these fundamental connections worked out. And so a lot of the organizations that I'm working with is, wow, you know, this is just so mind blowing and new and stuff. And then for, but obviously it's not, it's nothing that I'm bringing up. I'm just helping to facilitate the conversation and uh, bringing some of those resources. And I think Simon Sinek got it, you know, I think he nailed it. And I think, you know, I give him credit for being the one to really bring it to the forefront and create a, a, a norm around having these conversations about why and connection. So I understand how the why can all help and, yeah, and all yeah. of those things, but, but is there like, are you finding that it's actually long-term efficacy or is this something that you need to refresh just because it's the exercise itself that is more effective than anything? Yeah. Great question. Um, I think I would say this, you know, social media, um, marketing, all these things have a zillion different tools and we try different things out. Some things work, some things don't work. Just because something works for only a year doesn't mean that I throw it out because it doesn't stick for 10 years. Right, because it still worked for a year. It still worked for a year. Okay. So whatever I need to do now to help my team now and today, even if it doesn't stick, because you're exactly right. Um, you know, these things, they can get kind of sticky and they can get, you know, a little fluffy and they can, you know, leadership can change and they can go away. I am totally okay with that if for the short term I gave another tool to my team and my team had a boost of focus and impact and energy that lasted X number of days or weeks or months or years. I'm totally good with that. I wrote that down. You just, you literally opened up a blind spot that I didn't know I had. Good, good. Right, works today, still works. If it worked just 
for today or just for this month or just for this year, it still worked. Because honestly, yeah, I'm the type of person who, who is like, well, if it's only going to work for eight months, what's the point? Yeah. There is no point. Like, yeah. like I used to think this was my health. I thought that to get healthy, yeah. um, I've seen people get healthy and then not healthy. I've seen yeah. people be, be fit and then in their 50s and 60s or metabolism changes and they lose it. Yeah. And I was honestly like, well, if you're going to end up that way in your 50s and 60s anyway, what's the point? Yeah. Right? What's the point of lifting weights if you stop lifting weights and you lose your muscle? Mm-hmm. What's the point of bringing your team together and making, yourself, making everybody happy for six months if it's only going to last for six months? Well, well, the point well, of going to a conference and getting excited about something if I know in three months I'm going to forget it all. And, well, and that's the way I looked at the world. Yeah, and you're exactly right, Mark. And sometimes these little tools and little things, they may not last, but the impact will get you to the next level and they'll last. I like it, man. I got I to gotta, I gotta work on, these, I gotta work on these, these things in my head. I don't recommend a brain injury, but I will tell you that there are a lot of good benefits that, that come from it. <laughs> no, I just have my abusive childhood that I can yep. use as, a, as my own trauma, but, but nowhere near. Well, I mean, no well, one that, knows what you're dealing with. And, and, and Mark, that's the thing, right? Like, this is what I learned too. And this is, and you know this, cause you're a professional speaker. And this, this is the best part about my life now is every single time I give a keynote or work with a large company, every single time I have a line of people afterwards, not because they want to have me sign their book or they want to share. No, they want to share. Mark, I can't, you know, you know this cause this happens to you all the time. I can't tell you how fulfilling it is and rewarding and, and overwhelming it is. The every single keynote someone says, I've never shared this with anybody else, but I need to tell you something. Mm-hmm. I've never shared it. Why? Because I went on the stage, I was vulnerable, I shared something and showed them that something could come of it, right? You could use it as a tool or a resource. So all of a sudden it gives them permission. It's a universal experience to go through pain and trauma, every single person. And it's not about one is less or one or more, or one was a uh, broken, whatever. Trauma is trauma is trauma. Crisis is, tra- is crisis. Problem is problem is problem. But so few people have the ability, I think the permission to talk about these things because there's so much stigma involved. Mm. And so when we can erase that and get rid of all those voices and all that stigma, we see, holy crap, there's so much we can do and so much clarity that can come from what remains after we get through all those voices and insecurities, which yes, I do still carry around, but I'm constantly working at trying to uh, navigate through those. So, um, you know, I just, man, I encourage especially leaders and entrepreneurs to make sure they're sharing those stories of adversity, saying when things are challenging, saying to your teams and staff, you don't have all the answers and being willing to go through that, that process because you never know what's going to eventually evolve and, and, and come of it. Amazing. Amazing. I, I would like to, to, to leave by asking. And, and by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be totally rude. And by the yeah. way, just one more thing, Mark, I do want to thank you for putting on your website and your background information, the stuff that you've been through and the stuff that you went through in your life, because absolutely 100%, the stuff that you talked about resonates with people that you will never hear from. Um, your bravery and your courage and being able to outline some of those things and talk about them, no doubt has given others permission to start to deal with some of their issues. So don't overlook the power of communicating those, th- those things in any medium, whether it be on a platform or a blog or an article or a social media post. We've got to get more people comfortable with just talking about what is the human experience. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Made an impact say, on me. Oh, well, I appreciate that. <laughs> it's... It, diverting a little bit, you know, I, I, I wrote that because my, my friend Evan is an author and uh, I've been included in some of his books, much like your friend. You know, I, when you were talking about your Thunder Buddy, I was like, oh, my, my Thunder Buddy, Evan, <laughs> you know, we have another podcast together, but, but he wanted me to include, he was writing a book about service mm. that ultimately your, pur- your b- greatest purpose comes from the most painful parts of your life. And the most fulfilling thing you can do is to go out and help other people who have to overcome today yes. what you overcame in the past. Very, very simple kind of process. But um, he asked me to include some stuff. So I wrote that for that. And I sent it to him and he's like, it's not good enough, man. I was like, well, okay. 
Mm. So then I rewrote it again and I sent it to mm. him. He's just like, not good enough. And basically <laughs> I, I kept sending him stuff until I got to the point where um, hitting send, my hand was kind of shaking a little bit. Mm. And then, and then I, so I was like, I hit send and then I was like, Oh, shoot, I should probably talk to my mom and warn her mm. about some things I'm talking about. And she was fine with it. And then I released it. And then like the fear was gone. The anxiety was gone. I don't mm. think about people reading it. Um, sometimes I reread it now and I go, oh, I'm really putting myself out there. Yeah. <laughs> because, yeah. because I only, I'm only reminded of it when, yeah. when, I, when I do these interviews and people bring things up. But, yes. um, but, but I, I do appreciate it. And I think, you know, um, one, you know, like it's scary to hit send. Yeah. Um, but the whole purpose of this podcast, like doing hard things, right? It's scary to hit send, but, but you hit send and you're like, <sighs> like I had hair before COVID started. It was scary yeah. when, I shaved my head. <laughs> when I shaved my head, it was really scary. And I only did yeah. it because I was afraid of it. Yeah. And um, anyway, all, all of those things. But I, I wanted to ask you, because I'd like to leave each podcast by asking this. Yeah. Um, I think that most of us give up on ourselves too quickly. We don't realize how strong we really are. Um, we give in to the fear or the doubt or the anxiety, or the insecurities or whatever it is. What would be your tip, your number one tip for yourself or for others to face, to do, and to overcome the hard things? Oof. Do we have another four hours? That's, uh, that's, uh, wow. Um, um, you know, the, it's interesting that you talk about um, your buddy Evan, right? Um, with his focus on service. The thing that got me eventually off the Murphy bed, uh, there was that focus on hoping that someday I can create meaning. But a mentor of mine named Bill Hallmanderis, uh, his mentor, by the way, was Viktor Frankl. Um, Bill said, get off your butt and go volunteer at the local county food bank. And I said, what are you talking about? I'm like, I'm all jacked up. I'm a full-time patient. I'm, I don't know what the heck I'm doing in life. He's like, I don't care. Stop complaining. Go do some service. And I was like, what? And so I'll, I'll spare you the long story, but essentially I took his advice because I listened to people I trust like Bill and and I went to the county food bank and um, I was really bad at actually doing what they wanted me to do. But eventually I got better at being a volunteer and helping out there. And one day the phone rang from a hotline that I was uh, operating under and the, the person on the end of, end of the line said, I'm just calling you back to thank you for what you did for my family for putting that meal on the table. And oh my gosh, I was super charged. I mean, I was absolutely my tank was full, you know, full. It was overflowing. I couldn't believe here I was a zero with just like nothing to offer, college dropout, full-time patient. And somebody out there said, thank you, that I did something to positively impact them. And that actually started a whole domino effect where I showed up to rehab, to rehabilitation. I finally showed up and really started putting in the work to get my cognitive skills back and work on my visual injury and all the things I needed to work on. And so I guess if you're asking me for one tip to get through some challenge and change and adversity, it would be to hone into what your buddy talks about, uh, what Evan talked about and, and what you guys wrote about, um, which is try it, try service. When you're really empty and you have nothing left in your tank and you're trying to figure out how to get through some big challenges, Try figuring out a way to just call the local county food bank and seeing if you can volunteer because actually you'll get back twice as much as you put into service. And that can fuel whatever it is the next step on your journey uh, needs to be. And uh, so, so I think getting back to service in some ways, it's fundamentally a part of who we are and it can really start the process of driving change and overcoming challenge. I've got to tell you, I so enjoyed connecting with him that even after our interview was done, we still hung out for like another 20, 30 minutes and just talked. <laughs> so more than anything, I mean, what an inspiring interview. His story reminded me, but it should remind all of us how important it is to have a strong sense of purpose, which 
we can always drive home. Okay, key takeaways. Number one, don't shun change. Don't turn away from it, but see how you can use it as an opportunity to advance and to improve and to grow. Number two, honest but comfortable communication with your staff and your team is incredibly important for growth in your business and in your life. And number three, don't underestimate the power of having a really deep why, because you can always circle back on it. You can always keep yourself and your company focused and dedicated. You have to move. You have to build momentum. You have to work to make yourself proud. That is on you. I just want to remind you, you can always rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts. I would love that. If you're not subscribed, be sure to subscribe. And if you want to connect with me directly, follow me on IG and drop me a DM. Remember, those of us who have something to prove can show the world and ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. But you've got to think big. You've got to be bold. And you must say yes. If you like this conversation with Jacob Green, you must check out the last episode when I talked to Anthony Trucks. Mind-blowing. Go over there. I'll see you there.